Okay, well, thanks very much. Thank you certainly for the invitation to, to speak. Thanks to the OPC, both for uh, sponsoring this event and even more for its ongoing support of privacy research in Canada through the contributions program. Uh, it makes an enormous, as I think people in this room all know, it has, has had an enormous impact on, I think, our knowledge and our ability to engage in cutting edge research across the country and it's a program that is, is enormously worthwhile. Um, and thanks as well to Madeline Sagner, our Executive Director of the Center for Law, Technology and Society at the University of Ottawa, uh, who pulled all of this together in an amazing fashion. So thanks so much for all of that. Uh, so the title of my talk, as you can see, is Why, Why Watching the Watchers Isn't Enough. This is actually taken out of a, a chapter in a forthcoming book, so a little bit of an infomercial, Law, Privacy and Surveillance in Canada in the Post-Known Environment. It's being published by the University of Ottawa Press in a couple of months. Um, has contributions from people like Craig Forsyth, Kent Roach, Reg Whitaker, Tamir Israel, uh, Christopher Parsons, and others, and it is available under open access, uh, so it'll be free to download. And uh, what I want to talk about is essentially my contribution to that book as well. The shorter title, I guess, for this talk would be Against Oversight. Um, and my argument here is not that we ought not to focus on oversight. I think that's a, a given for most but rather the emphasis that we have seen and continue to see on oversight as somehow being the solution or one of the core mechanisms by which we can deal with the surveillance revelations over the last almost 20 months, uh, I think in some ways uh, may lead us to miss the forest for the trees. So when we first saw Ed Snowden um, with this picture, um, and for those that haven't seen Citizen Four where you get to see him just before and and just after, it's a movie that you must see. Uh, the, the story that we started to tell ourselves, at least here in Canada, amongst many, as the revelations began to come uh, around metadata collection, around the broad data mining with respect to internet-related companies and the, the prism, and frankly, the stories continued and continued and continued, was by and large that somehow this wasn't us. This was the United States, in the same way that David talks about that U.S. boogeyman, there was here the NSA boogeyman, so to speak, and that while this may be happening and Canadians may well be affected, uh, in some way this wasn't happening in our name, this was the U.S. engaged in this kind of surveillance. Well, as we know, it didn't take long, there are lots of revelations, it didn't take long before we learned that that story just doesn't hold any water. Um, we now know that the Snowden story is also our story. We know that the metadata programs that we see occurring in the United States have been occurring here too, and at times with real concerns from those who are, in, who have, who are charged with providing some amount of oversight in terms of trying to deal with it. We know that the kind of spying revelations that have come up through the NSA are our story as well, as we know that our agency, CSE, has been engaged in similar kinds of activity. We know that we actively cooperate at times on Canadian soil to engage in the same kinds of activities, whether it's at G8 or G20 or otherwise. We know that the airport wi so called airport Wi Fi tracking story, the seeming effort from some of our own officials with the CSE and elsewhere to try to almost impress their counterparts by showing just how good we can do this too. Um, in the airport Wi Fi example, the illustration of how tapping into uh, IP addresses there could allow or might allow for the tracking of traveler movements once they moved outside of the airport. And most recently, the revelations that uh, our agencies have been tracking or downloading tens of millions of downloads every single day, uh, and then using that information in the hope of tapping into other databases to directly try to identify persons of interest, to identify documents that might be uploaded to various file sharing sites or other sites that, that allow people to post this information online, identify the IP address associated with that, and then go to other databases, sometimes run by the GCHQ in the UK, that have billions of cookies in there and try to use some of that information with the other information to try to identify precisely who may have either uploaded a particular document or downloaded a document. And then, of course, just in the last couple of days, the CSE engaged in collecting hundreds of millions of email messages that Canadians send to their governments every single day 
um, and using that to track certain sorts of activity and then layering on top of all of that, literally as we speak, uh, C Bill C-51, the committee today talking about how many hearings they're prepared to have to talk about this piece of legislation that, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, has real implications for some of these issues as well. So the story that somehow Canada isn't involved or isn't active is clearly not true. And so the story that we then tell ourselves instead is that the way to deal with this is oversight. Our oversight is faulty, we hear it all the time, uh, and so what we need to do is to fix that oversight privacy commissioners or former privacy commissioners arguing that the way that we address this is with better oversight. Opposition parties taking the stand that the solution lies in better oversight. Private members bills with Joyce Murray's, for example, from the Liberal Party, focusing on improving oversight. The media focusing on improved oversight. Discussion in the House of Commons focusing on improved oversight. Op-eds talking about improved oversight. And I'm here to say that this is not just about oversight. Oversight, in a sense, provides, in my view, an easy out. The ability for those who don't want to directly criticize or to be seen to be directly criticizing legislation for fear of being seen as being weak uh, on terror, to focus instead on the process issues, that we have to instead deal with oversight. Well, I'm here to say that even if we fix the oversight, and make no mistake, there are clearly improvements that can be made on oversight, we will not have fixed the underlying problem. Now, in some ways, this is perfectly obvious. In the moments after some of these revelations, the existing oversight from the CSE commissioner, both on the airport Wi-Fi story and immediately after the initial Snowden revelations, unusually took directly to the public to say, I'm on the job. Uh, I have oversight responsibility and have no fear. We have reviewed what's taking place. We were aware of what is taking place. Uh, and it is consistent with Canadian law. Now, maybe the oversight commissioner, the CSE commissioner in this case, is wrong. Maybe the oversight is indeed faulty at that level. But what if he's right? What if, in fact, what is taking place is legal, is consistent with Canadian law? And if that is the case, then no amount of new layers of oversight whether new parliamentarians or other mechanisms that we might identify to allow for a more robust oversight is going to do anything to alter the kinds of activities that we have seen revealed or have been revealed over the last 20 or so months. So where do I think we must at least equally, and I would argue even more, focus our attention? Well, one area certainly is on the issue of metadata. We had references to that de-identification, re-identification earlier on the panel, but around the issue of metadata, what we've experienced in Canada over the last number of months is a, is a battle in a sense between the experts who, having studied the issue about what metadata can reveal, have been in locked in a sense in a battle that they are losing with politicians who say, I can't hear you. When you say that metadata allows for uh, the disclosure of identities, when you say that metadata has been used in numerous studies to allow people to get into the personal information in ways that we previously thought of solely with content, in a sense, I can't hear you. When General Michael Hayden in the United States says, we kill people based on metadata, I can't hear you. When the Supreme Court of Canada in R versus VU points to the privacy import of metadata, the politicians again and again say, I can't hear you. And so when repeated witnesses appeared on Bill C-13, the lawful access legislation, that in a week or so will take formal effect, and to talk about the standard, the threshold that was established with respect to essentially metadata, transmission data warrants, the response again and again was, I can't hear you. This isn't content, and a lower threshold is perfectly appropriate. And yet we know now that we engage and we have engaged in these metadata programs for some time, and that the level of protection that in fact has been accorded to the privacy associated with that information has been woefully low and not nearly commensurate with those who have expertise in the area have said uh, it, is, it is deserved. So too with the issue of jurisdiction. And David highlighted uh, some of the jurisdictional questions I think really nicely in talking about how that data flows freely across borders. 
Now, many of you will know that the CSE's mandate is very often to, is to say that they cannot target Canadians. And yet I would suggest to you that when we learn of the capture of tens of millions of downloads every day, what is by any reasonable definition mass surveillance, you cannot at the same time argue that you engage in mass surveillance and at the same time argue that you do not target Canadians. In a sense, what our agencies would like us to believe is that if you target everyone, you effectively target no one. And so are therefore consistent with the law because they are hoovering up tens of millions of downloads that yes, some, some of which may come from Canadians, but we are not directly targeting those Canadians. Yet we know that if you indiscriminately capture all of this information, tens of millions of downloads on a daily basis, you know that effectively Canadians are targeted because you are targeting all. And yet the interpretations that we see at least to date, presumably from our oversight commissioner, is that somehow this is consistent with the mandate. It is difficult to see how. So too with that, the way in which information moves effortlessly across borders. Another chapter in the book that I reference comes from Andrew Clement, who talks about the boomerang effect, where we learned that for some of the largest providers in the country, they refused to exchange traffic with other Canadian providers here in Canada. And so if you are a subscriber with some of the largest ISPs in the country, where you are sending messages, where you are visiting websites, the exchange point takes place not domestically here in Canada, but rather in the United States, very often in Chicago. And in doing so, it immediately falls into that NSA surveillance activities that we know so much about. We must find ways, I would argue, to deal with jurisdiction and to be more honest about the ways in which um, our laws, which seek to somehow differentiate on a jurisdictional basis, have been rendered largely meaningless at times as that jurisdiction is blurred. We heard also from David about the information sharing that takes place as between agencies, the Five Eyes Consortium and the like, and that notion that somehow uh, we can hive off what Canadians are doing as opposed to others, and we hear insistently that somehow they each operate on their own, yet in some level of cooperation. Yet when we learn of some of these programs and see the degree to which, not just that there is cooperation, but that there is accessibility as between databases to provide a far larger data pool, I think we must surely recognize that these agencies work together in a manner that even where there are legal restrictions on what our own agency does, Many of those can effectively be circumvented through this Five Eyes work. We know too about the limits of domestic, uh, the limits of domestic protections here in Canada through PIPEDA and otherwise. With still today the largest telecom provider in the country not providing a transparency report. We've seen it from others, but Bell in particular standing to still today and refusing to disclose to their millions of Canadians customers not on an individual level, but even on an aggregated level, the kind of cooperation that they provide uh, to law enforcement as part of these requests is with all respect positively shameful. And what I would argue it calls for is a clear mandate within the law to, to ensure that not just that this can happen, it's fairly clear that it can given that we've seen TELUS and Rogers do so, but rather that it must we know to the limits of all of this when we take a look at the RCMP audit conducted by the uh, OPC. It's an important audit to be sure and it is in a sense an example of some of the oversight that we have. But when our own privacy commissioner's office can go into an audit and find at the end of the day that they can't actually do the audit because there isn't the data there, because there isn't the record keeping there, the kinds of domestic protections that we have are simply inadequate. We know too that the U.S. protections, once this information makes its way into the United States, are also simply inadequate. Those constitutional protections that David talked about don't accrue to me. I'm not a U.S. citizen. When my information is elsewhere, I don't enjoy that level of protection. It is a two-tier sort of protection that exists in the United States to the extent to which there is that kind of protection. And it is an enormous problem that our government should be advocating on our behalf, but given where it stands, even domestically, I'm not holding my breath. And then finally, there is the changes that we see taking place, particularly the information sharing provisions within Bill C-51. If the Privacy Act was about anything, 
dating back now decades. It was about providing protection for the information collected by individual government departments and ensuring that the sharing the, of that information enjoyed a certain amount of protection. When one looks at what C-51 does on information sharing, identifying 17 different departments and agencies and ministries who may all cro now cross-share information if this is passed for reasons that extend so far beyond just terrorism to include just about anything from an economic perspective and otherwise, the very rationale of this legislation, I would say, is positively gutted. Indeed, even more, there is the catch-all provision within this legislation that says that at the end of the day, not only can it be shared amongst these agencies, but can be shared to any person for any purpose. The very notion of privacy from our own governments is lost within Bill C-51 with a government that, with all respect, at least earlier this week, had been talking about going through this bill with no more than two or three days' worth of hearings. And so we talk a lot about oversight. Indeed, we even talk about it within the context of C-51. It is necessary to be sure, but it is by no means sufficient, because the danger, I would argue, that we face is that even if we get the oversight right, what we leave in place uh, is a legal framework that provides us so little protection that no amount of oversight will make a true difference. Thanks very much for your attention.